Hey, it's Will from LearnerAdor, and in this video I'm going to walk you through the 2012 AP Microeconomics FRQ question number one, which is related to a loss generating monopolist. So similar to the FRQ question number one of 2013 and 2014, this one relates to a monopolist, so we will be thinking about things like marginal revenue equals marginal cost, and what are the implications of doing that? So let's go ahead and get started. This question states, Steve Rail, the only provider of train service operating between two cities, is currently incurring economic losses. Using a correctly labeled graph, show each of the following. Steve Rail's loss minimizing price and quantity, the area of economic losses, the allocatively efficient quantity, and then after that we need to consider if Steve Rail raised its price above PM identified in Part A1, would total revenue increase, decrease, or not change? So first let's think about how we draw this. Right now we are given an economic loss of a monopolist, and so the first thing we want to do is we want to think about the standard price on quantity. And so what we know first right off the bat is that we will have a demand curve that is downward sloping. And we also know is that if you were to take the derivative of the, of the demand curve, you would get the marginal revenue. And we also know that we will have some sort of average total cost that is greater than the price that we are setting. So first let's think about what the marginal cost would look like. In this case we may be faced with a marginal cost that goes something along the lines of this. And then given that, what we know is that the monopolist would set marginal revenue equal to marginal cost. And so we know that we would be right here and if we were to go all the way down, we would get QM. That's where the monopolist would set their quantity because that's where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. And then wherever that strikes the demand curve would be where the monopolist would set their price since they have market power. So now that we have the basic monopolist situation, we need to consider the fact that the monopolist is taking economic losses. So because the monopolist is taking economic losses, what that means is that the price that the monopolist is setting is less than average total cost. So we may have an average total cost that's up here. So what this shows us intuitively is that the monopolist is not covering their overall cost of providing this train service. And this actually makes sense on an intuitive level because many train services in the United States are actually subsidized by governments because the fares are priced low so that more people, such as people in need that may not be able to afford more expensive modes of transportation, can use the public transit service. So in this case, we've already gone ahead and labeled PM and QM. We've need to label the area of economic losses. So essentially that is equivalent to whatever the monopolist is not covering. So in this case it would be the area that, let's go with magenta, it would be the area from the price that the monopolist sets until he hits the average total cost. So this would be the area of economic losses because what the monopolist is setting is not covering his average total costs and therefore th these represent economic losses that the monopolists are not covering. So that covers part two. And then finally we need to label the allocatively efficient quantity. So this is your classic P equals MC situation. So what we need to do is we need to do, actually let's go with green price equal marginal cost, in other words demand equals marginal cost. So the demand curve will intersect the marginal cost curve right here. And therefore this point would be where the efficient quantity is. So that's QE. 
So now let's think about part B. If steam rail raised the price above PM identified in P part A1, would total revenue increase, decrease, or not change? So what we know in this case is that in order to figure this out, we need to look at the marginal revenue curve and see if it's positive, negative, or equal to zero. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's think about you know, what the marginal revenue curve is at this point. So right now, at PM, we're talking about this point right here. I'm going to go ahead and change that to blue so that you can see that a little bit more clearly. And what we know is that when the monopolist prices at PM, the marginal revenue is positive. So marginal revenue is greater than zero at the point PM. So if the monopolist were to price higher than PM, so in this region, then you see that the marginal revenue is also still positive. So what that means is that we are in a price elastic area of the overall consumer demand. And so what does that mean? Well, intuitively, if something is price elastic, then that means that people are highly reactive to an increase or decrease in prices. In other words, when you think about elasticity, you can think about the percentage change in quantity versus the percentage change in price. And you can think about this as an idea of if the if Steve Rail, the monopolist, were to go ahead and increase their price, there would be naturally a decrease in quantity. But what you need to consider here is the elasticity of this interaction. In this case, we know that it's elastic. And what that means is that the influence of Q from the increase in price is going to be greater than the increase in price. So in other words, the raising of the price above PM is going to make more people likely to change their mode of transportation than the amount of additional revenue that's incurred from raising the price. So therefore, I guess to think about it in a number sense, think about raising your price 3, but your quantity goes down by 6. So here, essentially, you've raised your price, but the quantity of riders is bigger and substantially larger than your price because we are in a price elastic component in which, it would, in which we, uh, we are faced with a marginal revenue greater than 0. And therefore, the overall influence of that would be that total revenue would decrease. And that would be your answer for part B. So again, the intuition behind that is the fact that we know that the elasticity at that point is elastic because marginal revenue is greater than zero. And therefore, if we were to raise the price, the increase in revenue from the increase in price is smaller than the amount of people and the loss of revenue from people changing modes. All right, so now let's tackle part C, which is asking about a per unit subsidy provided to Steve Rail. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and redraw that graph. And so what we know is that there is a downward sloping demand. There is a marginal revenue. marginal cost, and there's an average total cost. All right, so now let's think about what a per unit subsidy does. So a per unit subsidy is effectively a way to decrease the marginal cost of Steve Rail. Intuitively, this makes sense because what the government or an outside source of funding is essentially providing is a certain amount of money to help Steve Rail when it produces an additional unit of quantity. Therefore, because it's per unit, we influence the marginal cost rather than the average total cost because it depends on how many units Steve Rail is going to provide. So effectively, if you think about it, this per unit subsidy is a decrease in marginal cost for Steve Rail, and therefore Steve Rail has a new marginal cost that is to the right of the original marginal cost. So now let's think about how this interacts with marginal cost equals marginal revenue. 
So the place where marginal cost intersected marginal revenue in the first part was here. And we remember that that led us to set price and quantity at this point. And then we know now that the marginal cost curve has essentially shifted down. And as a result of that, we need to see where marginal cost 2 intersects marginal cost or marginal revenue, which is going to be at this point. I'm going to label that QM2. And then taking that all the way up, I'll be able to see where Steve Rail would set their price now. So this is PM2. And so now we need to see what happens with the quantity. Well, as you can clearly see here, the quantity has shifted to the right. And therefore, quantity has gone up. And my explanation there would be the per unit subsidy effectively decreases the marginal cost. And therefore, as a result of that, it will make it so that Steve Rail is more willing to produce a higher quantity. So now the second part of the question is asking about consumer surplus. So what we need to think about is what the original consumer surplus is and what the new consumer surplus is. So in this case, the consumer surplus in the first case would be this triangle here. And then now the consumer surplus has changed to this triangle. So what's effectively happened is the consumer surplus has increased as a result of the decrease in price and increase in quantity. And so if you think about that for a second, that makes sense because there has been a decrease in price. Consumers are now willing to buy more units. So consumers get the benefit from the per unit subsidy because Steve Rail now can provide a more competitive price to their consumers. So the answer to that is that consumer surplus goes up. And again, the explanation behind that is the change in the marginal cost makes it so that Steve Rail is more willing to produce more units and therefore the price can drop. Now let's think about a lump sum subsidy. In this case we are talking about a lump sum subsidy which means that the average total cost is the one affected. So let's think about that for a second and what a lump sum subsidy means. A lump sum is essentially a one-time payment. It's a subsidy that's provided just once for the firm. And therefore, the way to think about this drop in average total cost is that there is some sort of outside funding, whether that's from the government or some other source, that is going to be influencing Steve Rails' average total cost, but it doesn't influence Steve Rails' marginal cost. And that's really important to, to understand the distinction. Because in the first case, a per unit subsidy, uh, in the first case, we had a per unit subsidy where the marginal cost was influenced, but now we're faced with just a one-time uh, subsidy, and therefore average total cost is the one affected and not marginal cost. So in answering the first question, does deadweight loss increase, decrease, or not change, you need to think about that original circumstance of the monopolist setting marginal revenue equal to marginal cost. And what we know from this is that the marginal revenue and the marginal cost curve are not changing. So therefore, they will still set quantity at QM, and they will still set price at PM. And therefore, this leads to no change in the overall deadweight loss. So again, I'm going to go over that to make sure that that makes sense. Um, but essentially, what happens in a lump sum subsidy is we are faced with a change in average total cost rather than a change in marginal cost. And therefore, we see a change in the uh, average total cost going down, but we do not see a change in the marginal cost, and as a result, the QM and PM that's set by Steve Rail remains the same, and therefore there is no change in deadweight loss. Finally, let's think about the economic losses. So this is thinking about the overall original question um, in part A, in which we were asked to shade the area of economic losses, and if you, if you remember that, that was essentially the area from the original average total cost. So if you were to extend this average total cost, so let's say for example this average total cost went all the way up and this one did too. As we went over in part A, we saw that the average total cost was the difference between the price that's set by 
Steve Rail and what they're actually um, spending. So that was this entire region here, if you were to think about it. It's this rectangle. But now, as a result of this lump sum subsidy, your average total cost has gone down, and therefore, we are faced with a new area of economic losses. It's a little bit difficult to see, so I'm going to change to black. And then here we see that this area of economic losses has gone down because we have essentially decreased how much it costs for us as a firm to provide this level of service. So this lump sum subsidy effectively decreases average total cost and as a result we are faced with a decrease in economic losses. So that would be your explanation there. The decrease in in ATC essentially decreases uh, the cost to the firm and therefore at QM it's now uh, cheaper and as a result we have less economic losses. So that pretty much covers it in terms of question number one for the 2012 AP Micro exam. If you need additional questions as always feel free to check out LearnRater for hundreds of AP Micro questions. Um, all of our easy and medium questions are free to try so check that out and good luck.